Uh, thanks for your uh, patience. Uh, we're gonna start in the next uh, two seconds. Uh, I'm just gonna take a drink of water really fast and then we'll begin. that out of the way. Uh, welcome to the Gold Line Press and Ricochet Editions launch party for our recently released titles, as well as a celebration of some of our beloved authors from our catalog. As some of you may already know, Gold Line and Ricochet are sibling presses at the University of California, Southern California with different aesthetic traditions. Uh, over the years, the presses have transformed with new PhD students in creative writing and literature, fulfilling editor, editing roles at both presses every year. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the editors for these teams. Uh, some are not here today, but I still want to recognize them. Uh, for Ricochet, we have Laura Roque, distrib uh, distrib distribution editor, Thomas Frangillian, editorial editor, Matt Kessler, publicity editor, and Tisha Marie Reichel Aguirre, managing editor. At Goldline Press, we have myself, nonfiction editor Marcus Clayton, Sarah Featheroff, our poetry editor, and Jocelyn Takix, our fiction editor, and Mario Lang, editor-in-chief. A few accessibility notes about today's event. Uh, three of us will be, cap well, two of us will be, cap uh, will be live captioning this event, so please refer to the closed captioning button on your Zoom screen for subtitles. You can click show subtitles or view full transcript to follow along. Uh, we plan to upload the video to YouTube after the event with subtitles so you can view this reading again at home and share with everyone. You know, it's Sunday afternoon, so some might not be able to make it, but you can still share with them after the event's over. All right. So we have eight readers today, uh, wonderful, wonderful authors that have been published at Ricochet and Goldline. So we want to make sure they all have their full time. So let's get started right now All right, with our first reader of the day. Um, Angie Sejun Lo is the daughter of Chinese immigrants. She is a Kuniman Fellow, a PhD candidate in literature and creative writing at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and, and is a calculus instructor at San Quentin State Prison. She lives in Oakland. So let's give it up for Angie. Thank you for that, Marcus. Um, Thank you, Goldline Press, for publishing my work and for inviting me to be here this afternoon. I just wanted to begin with a special thank you to Muriel Liang for the truly angelic oh. Um This chapbook began three years ago as a final project of a class I was taking in my program. And Muriel is the one who nurtured and edited it from its nascent stages to um, this like fleshly living thing you can hold in your hands. So this is also my first time reading from the book. Um, the title is All We, All we Ask Is You To Be Happy. And I'm just going to read two very short poems for, for you from it. Okay, this first poem draws from something that my grandmother um, said to US Customs and Border Control maybe many years ago. Um, she doesn't have a birth certificate because she was born before it was a common practice um, in certain remote villages in China to record births and deaths in, in this way. Nowhere in the scalding dark could I find a useful signifier. Crawling through girl-sized holes tinged with use, only black markets must keep their ciphers to themselves. The muted flesh of fish, pupils dark as if drowned during a baptism. The immigration officer asks for her proof of birth and she says, here I am, proof I was born. It's true what they say about origin, how each of us circles a coreless periphery, how water returns as ice with subtle infection. I separate bone from fatty flesh, use every whisker in the broth. What remains is the curdled gaze of chrysanthemum growing in the lot, the years engraved on my palms, strangely lit. At night, I dream of a Buddha who never prays. He plucks drones from the sky, sucks on them like lollipops. 
Okay, the second poem is um, draws from a course I teach at UC Santa Cruz um, in ancient Chinese history and philosophy. And what you might need to know is in the Shang Dynasty, um, divine soothsayers would carve oracles in the bones of animals and um, heat them up and read the ways they cracked in order to predict the future of a certain emperor or a dynasty, dynasty's rule. And this is a divination technique from 1600 BCE. This poem's called Ritual Warfare. I lift my window open all night and now rain gushes in my bedroom as if through two milk white teeth. I look outside and witness another year growing around a tree, the ring engraved on its bones, strangely lit. A long time ago, I was told of shamans carving oracles in the shoulder blades of oxen, the diligence in which they heated bones and deciphered etchings, squinting under pale light. You say you hate the mole living on your upper lip. The next evening I witness you carve it out with a razor blade. It's strange how we knife up magnolias, force them into bloom, how we can no longer wait for real gods to come slice us open. Already I've forgotten my past incarnations. We fall asleep with the lights on. You put your head in my palms the way a tree, thunder charred, refuses to reveal how it became dead and still empties itself for my touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angie, that was wonderful. Um, also, a side note, if, you know, we can't hear each other, obviously, but if we feel especially moved by something, you know, show it off in the chat, you know, people use em emojis and, you know, emoji hearts at this moment. Those are great ways to show appreciation, you know, you can snap while muted if you like, anything you want. All right, uh, so our next reader, uh, Karen Marone lives and writes in Tel Aviv. Her fiction chapbook, Bass, 1998, was published in 2020 by Gold Line Press. She is a creative nonfiction editor and the production editor of the Illinois Review and is an alumnus of Bar Ilan University's graduate program in creative writing. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to read two pieces from my uh, flash fiction chapbook, Bass 1998. And uh, I won't go into too much detail right now about what the collection is about, but I will say very briefly that it's a sort of uh, deconstruction of our conversation with the anthology, Best American Short Stories, 1998. So um, this first one, I felt like I had to read because I felt like I couldn't just stand here in my living room in Tel Aviv and, and read stories to you all without um, acknowledging what's going on in this region right now. So. Um, this piece talks about Tel Aviv around the time of the second intifada uh, about 20 years ago. And unfortunately, what I was trying to say in this story is uh, even more true now. And this piece is called Every Night for a Thousand Years. The tourists stand on the hostel balcony, shirtless, sun on their golden skin and hair, or maybe their skin is the sun. More are coming, walking down the street, laughing, singing in other languages, holding bottles of beer just purchased from the kiosk, coated in beach salt and sand, going to their rooms to change before they go back out again. The hostel is behind a bus stop on Hakuvshim Street in Tel Aviv, where I'm waiting for the bus to go home to my parents' house. I'm returning from the beach. It is a Friday and I have a day off. I have five shekels in my hand to pay the fare. I am a soldier and soldiers ride for free, but you have to wear your uniform and who would do that on a Friday? The sidewalk where I'm standing is separated from the hostile grounds by an aluminum fence topped with barbed wire, the type that gets set up temporarily to protect construction sites, but there is no construction. Over the years, the fence has begun to sag so the wire touches sidewalk. I'm not paying attention and it scratches my hand. The street name, Hakuv Shim, means the conquerors, 
a name that commemorates the members of the Irgun who conquered the Manchia neighborhood in Jaffa in 1948, leveling it, erasing all life there. A name that was selected when this was something we were proud of. The ruins pushed into the sea, a park built on top of them. I am terrified of buses, of all closed public spaces, but you cannot just stop living, so I continue to ride buses. If someone gets on the bus with a coat too big or bags too heavy, or leaves his bag on a seat and walks away, you just duck below the seat or head for the door to escape the explosion, but you don't say anything because it's probably nothing and you'll just embarrass yourself. The hostels in Tel Aviv are shutting down. I once read a magazine article that explained why this is happening. Tourists who travel the world like to find jobs in the cities they visit, stay there a while and earn money for room and board. But in Tel Aviv, the magazine says, the cost of living is so high, the tourists can't earn enough to keep themselves in Heineken's or Gold Stars rather. So they go elsewhere. But I know that is not the real reason. The tourists are leaving because the light is being sucked away from the city. The light that right now still shines down from them onto Hakushim, touching my bare shoulders like a secret. Yes, it exists, this youth, this beauty, but not for you. Okay, and this next one is uh, a short one, uh, a little lighter, um, which was inspired by the daily digest that I used to get from Quora and I could never quite bring myself to unsubscri unsubscribe from. And uh, this one also deals with current events. Uh, and I mean, of course, Elon Musk. Hello, Quora, thanks for listening. I have a few questions, not too many. How are you? Ha <laughs> ha. Have you ever seen someone who looked completely dead inside? And when did you first realize that you don't really know anyone? And do pilots tell the passengers on a plane when they're about to crash? Does my therapist actually care about what I'm saying or is it a charade? And what's it like to live in Kansas City, Missouri? And also what makes Elon Musk so good at email communication? And which phone does Elon Musk have? And what was Elon Musk's GPA at UPenn? And did the severe bullying that Elon Musk received in school contribute psychologically to his present entrepreneurial makeup? And what should I do when I get tired of living? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Always love a good Elon Musk bashing. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, who's, who's next? Uh, Daniel Beagleson is the author of the book of Being Neighbors, Ricochet Editions, and the chapbook Only the Borrowed Light by Verse. He serves as a director of the Visiting Writer Series at Northwest Missouri State University, where he also works as an editor for the Laurel Review. He holds an MFA from the University of Montana, an MA from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, hails from New Jersey, and lives near Kansas City with his wife and children. Find him at danielbegason.com. Daniel, take it away. Oh, thank you. Um, I just uh, want to thank everyone uh, at Ricochet, uh, Tisha, Tom, Matt, and Laura for bringing my work out in the world. This is my first book, so I'm very excited to be able to share it with you all. Of course, everyone at Goldline for helping organize the reading, and I like to thank all the other writers um, sharing this kind of virtual stage. It's, it's an honor uh, and a privilege to read with you all today, so thank you. Um, I'm going to share two poems from my book. The first is from the major serial sequence that structures the book, Neighbors, so this is the Neighbors one, and it begins with an epigraph from uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, History has made us all neighbors. Replace I with you. Replace clouds with branches. Exculpate my heart. Replace my heart with another organ, the eyes with iris aperture, or hear the body with the body. Extinguish the inner ear. Imagine the scroll work. There are times when ascent is impossible. Hear the way the syllables sound, the words ring, excise the plague of grasshoppers from the crisp field, the schoolyards, the white lawns. We call the patch of pin oak leaves against a backdrop of memorial sky, fingernail the edges and pull. Walk in rubber soles, refuse leather, what's to bind the arms, to wrap the forehead in tefillin. You are made in whose image, place neighbor with children, 
Redact silence and silence is impossible. Also a symbol, see a symbol, place symbol with synapse, move on to arrive at the synagogue. Because I believe I'm angered by the slightest hiss. Imagine a parade jumping around the town square, the brick and mortar courthouse with a hint of Roman tracery. See the angles from various angles, above, treeward, through the legs, the limbs, the thrown pink and blue bubblegum scattering under lawn chairs, scrambling, redact stained glass. As a child entering to see swastikas spray painted on the ark, now again, plagued and plagued by continuity, layer upon layer, bewildering specificity, subsumed by synchronicity, a ritual we chronicle, place message with memory with message. We feel the past lifted upon us differently then. Now again, I am raged but plagued by hibernating guilt, a cryogenic wood frog. I told myself this is a safe place, saved by people. Which people? I had children, I had children. I am afraid of revelation. I am until the sun shines. Once I tried to set aside you, try again. Once I tried to set aside rage, I keep finding myself driving down the highway, confusing bone tires with black crows. They've been circling for eternity. Do you believe in eternity? Infinity? Affinity? For once, can we pray without ropes around the prayer? Exchange branches for wires. Extinguish the clouds. We are the murmuration turning over the earth with our predatory eyes. We are the field turned over and under. We want to preserve our singularity. We can no longer look at each other. Um, and the next and the last is a uh, we move in abundance. It's a ridiculous argument, but my son stands his ground. Why can't he attach a balloon to a teacup and fly to New Jersey? Why is our neighbor's yard filled with dandelions and drift? Why do you own a house and not a home? Why do you mow the lawn and despise clover? It's bedtime. The fawn is speckled, tears the grass up so the roots dangle in the mouth. Does the gardenia sleep in a garden bed? Go to sleep. Stars, my God, go to sleep. And what about the column of air above, the water rights below? Why is the ground so hard even after rain? Why do I keep falling in love with words when words mean less? Petrichor, Petrichor, bless my children. Baruch, Baruch, what have years done to this poem? Catastrophe upon catastrophe, each to each as layers of sediment disparately touched. Why is a bell ringing? Why do we long for a past we never lived or even visited like tourists in Neil Young t-shirts staring into an Icelandic volcano? Why does my friend sold their stained glass windows in his garage at night, fumbling with light? Why a bell ringing? Why do I assume all the hives of my life exist somewhere still as if I could walk into anyone again and end somehow here? Why do I feel guilty for writing this poem? The privilege it marks us helps us, makes us legible, think other of us. Someone, someone is playing a violin on the subway platform again. Someone has an open case of cast coins and a few fisted dollars. Someone has a litter of roses. Someone is hailed, holding hands with someone. Someone in white kicks tips up right on their toes to see the light pouring out from the tunnel. Someone's headphones look like earmuffs. Someone is playing with a bow, gracefully easing along strings when the shooting begins and people we know and don't know scream and crouch, scatter and dive, cover heads and fall. Do we experience the same violence from the inside out, the outside in, save it and store it and feed it to each other, wildly or gently as poison, the same table of a passing conversation, the same altar of a passing prayer, bitter, brittle stone, my God, it was not mine or ours here. Some of us go on to bend down and tie our laces as torrents of people pour past. Some of us go on to lift up faces from the blue light of our phones and shift stream. Go on to clamor out of dreams, climb stairs and clatter into the evening air. 
float off like blooms, uniformly distinct, rendered and unredeemable, earthly and inhuman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was that was beautiful. That was really well done. Um, those of you who are joining us, welcome. Uh, those of you who are having internet issues and joining us again, welcome back. Uh, our next reader is Kaylee Dalton, who is the author of the chapbook Mother Tongue by Goldline Press 2021. You can find their work published or forthcoming in the Offing, Pinwheel Journal, Pen Review, and Agave Review. A poet, zine maker, and science educator, they have presented their work at arts and activist events in Seoul, Los Angeles, and New York. Born in Yujongbu, South Korea, they currently live in New York. I apologize if I messed up the pronunciation of that, but please welcome Kaylee. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to celebrate Goldline Press and Ricochet's titles together and the launch of the Goldline Press chapbooks. Um, and in particular, I wanna thank Muriel and Sarah for working with me through the editing process and Brent who's here. Um, and I wrote um, this book in Brent's class. Um, so he built <laughs> the environment for my book to be born into. I won't go too much into what my book is, um, but it does chronicle a journey um, that happened about four years ago now, um, both a physical journey to meet my Korean mother and a more metaphorical journey, reconfiguring my ideas of family and how expansive family and love can be. Um, and this book intertwines both recipe and poetry as a way to consider the ways that food and recipe in particular um, have been both a channel that has simultaneously connected me to and kept me from um, my heritage. Okay, Poem of Poems. In 1914, the first recipe book is published in Korea. They name it Shie Tsonso or Poem of Poems. Each page in the book has 12 lines. Each line in the book has 27 syllables. Before the recipe book, daughters learn to cook from their mothers, standing shoulder to shoulder in the kitchen with the orange stain of chili powder, the fresh burn of garlic. We do not know how old this type of knowledge is the kind that reproduces itself. Before the recipe, we had only poems and bodies to remember. What our ancestors buried? What is a grave and what is a garden? My mother will never know what I am looking for. The imprint of her knees pressed into the soil, the way she teaches me how to cultivate life born either a mistake or a miracle. I know I am an impatient gardener and a bad daughter. We are scared of becoming our mothers because we do not know them and we are scared of forgetting ourselves. My mother often reminds me what I do not know, what it feels like to be a mother, but maybe I will someday understand when and or if she remembers to be a daughter is to be bad by definition. After the recipe book, I don't learn how to cook from my mothers. Not beside them, I am beside myself in the kitchen. I am after the recipe. I am after the poem. I am after the body. I am the aftermath of a memory not asked for. Uh, this next poem is called Home Economics. Consider the market. Consider the gross domestic product of Korea. Call it kimchi. 
Ferment culture in a brine of K's buried underground. In the spring, it comes out KBBQ, K-pop, K-dramas. Consider that Japan renamed Korea during its occupation. So Japan would be first alphabetically. Consider the ways we want to be read by our colonizers, the impossibility of being written otherwise. Consider that Korea's early exports were bodies cast across water, women and children first, brides and babies. Consider the ways they make us palatable, call us culture, Ferment children in a brine of K's buried underground, they come out kids. Consider the connotations. Consider that my parents renamed me during my adoption, so my name would be more conveniently exotic. Consider that a white girl taught me how to write my name in Hangul, a ghost of my colonizers, a Korea boo. Consider my mother at work receiving a phone call. She says she was very calm. She did not cry. Consider that at work, she called my name out for the first time, finally having language in my place. Consider that after work, she went to the market to buy groceries like any other day. Consider the market. I'm going to read two more. Um, the last one's really short. Um, okay, this one is called Morning Sickness. I wonder how many times my mother and I have wondered if the other was dead, whether her ghosts outnumber mine. Neither of us are morning people, really. Neither of us cry ourselves to sleep. We drink instead, we forget. Koreans drink and eat. Americans drink and deprive. Being both, it's only fair I drink and see double the contradiction, being both hungry and full. My mother, however, is a bad Korean, a vegan. At company meetings, she turns over meat and turns to her glass. One night she comes back home, already drunk. I am digging at a frozen persimmon with a spoon. We clink beer cans, we drink, we feel less foreign to each other. We feel each other's fingers. Our hands are mirrors of each other, if nothing else. I can't believe I'm feeling this, she says, meaning me. I held you for seven months and I never thought I'd see your face. I can believe what she's saying she's feeling or at least that first phone call with my adoption agent felt too premature. For the news is all bad and no news is good news. I thought she had to be dead. I lost my breath wishing for hers. I did not prepare for this life. Neither did my mother. Okay, um, this is my last poem and it's a little different. Maybe I was hoping to end on a little bit more of a uplifting note. <laughs> um, so this poem is called Repair. An Asian pear is like a pear, except more crisp in texture is like an apple, except brighter, flesh alive against my teeth. An Asian pear is never a metaphor, always a hybrid. I learn you are what you eat, and I learn people don't want to eat anything that reminds them of the body. The body is like a pear, or like an apple, except brighter, flesh alive against my teeth. She says, your body is like soup because it warms my hands. I like that because I believe my body takes new shape depending on who is holding. Not like anything else, 
in her hands, I am a body spilling out of itself. Thank you. And thanks to see so many friends here. <laughs> so much for that reading that was that was fantastic that was beautiful um we've had four amazing readings in a row so far it's been a great great sunday afternoon don't you think uh let's go for four more next up alejandro heredia is a queer afro-dominican writer and community organizer born in santo domingo and raised in the bronx he is a 2018 vona voices fellow in 2019 dream yard radical poetry Consortium Fellow. Miriam Gerba selected Alejandro's chapbook, You're the Only Friend I Need, as the winner of the 2019 Gold Line Press Fiction Chapbook Contest. Alejandro's work has been featured in Auburn Avenue Magazine, La Galleria uh, Magazine, No Dear Magazine, and elsewhere. Take it away, Alejandro. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I wanna start by saying uh, thank you to the many, many people that make this uh, book possible, um, especially Jocelyn and Muriel for answering all of our emails and uh, working with us in this project uh, for the last over a year now. Um, it really does take a village to bring a book into the world. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the story, You're the Only Friend I Need. I wrote this book because I am very invested and curious about friendship, the possibility for friendship to uh, change, uh, uplift, or destroy our lives. <laughs> so yeah, I'll get started. I'm just going to read a few paragraphs. It'll be, I think, pretty short. For context, uh, this story takes place in Santo Domingo. There are uh, two boys. Um, and I use that word loosely in a cafeteria in the city. That's where we're starting. They wait at la cafeteria colonial, order one coffee to share, negro con azúcar. Fabio thinks most of it, drinks most of it and talks ardently about the cafe. It is famous for hosting some of the nation's most illustrious minds, painters, writers, even revolutionaries met here in their youth as far back as the 1930s. Men who would later become leaders of the pueblo and enemies of the nation's authoritarian elite. All these heroes strung together by the coffee he drinks from now. Fabio's favorite poet is Pedro Mir. It's rumored that the writer once sang his most famous poem here, that the walls of the cafeteria were filled with laments about the tierra, this sad old country. I bet he's a maricón too. Fabio whispers into Noel's ear to avoid the curious eyes of the other customers. The only thing Fabio loves more than the great Dominican poets is twisting their poetry to create queer, alt queer alternatives of their lives. Mir isn't sad about the country. He's sad because he's not getting fucked. Cartagena Portal Latin writes about una mujer sola, not because of the great social burden placed on Dominican women, but because she's a raging lesbian. The dream she writes is about finding another woman, eloping under the Caribbean sky. Even Salome, founding mother of Dominican letters, is subject of his queer reconstruction of history. Why do you think she started th that school for all girls? You're sick, Noel says, rolls his eyes, but he laughs. Their minds are what draws them together. They're not particularly excellent at school. Fabio gets better grades because he can focus last minute and pass the test, but for the most part, they go unnoticed by teachers and the few students who compete to get good grades. Rather, it's their curious obsessions that bind them. Noel with his, with his facts about the solar system, Fabio with his querying of Dominican poets. Even if they know little about the other's interest, they listen to and entertain each other's fantasies. And of course, there is a secret that everyone knows, but no one braves themselves to say. They've never had serious girlfriends, not anything of significance in any way. No relationship status could hide their mannerisms, their walk, the way they hold their hands, how their eyes roll to, roll to the back of their heads when they're annoyed, far too flamboyant not to be noticed, especially Fabio. When Noel is shy, 
Fabio is unapologetic and exuberant. Any attempt to justify these mannerisms was thrown out the window in ninth grade when Fabio got into a fist fight with one of the popular girls in school. Maricon, she called him, back when that word was still a fresh wound. After Fabio's fight, there was no question. Fabio was a girl fighting Maricon, and Noel, by association, was Maricon adjacent, far too close to be considered straight. I'm gonna skip a little bit and read um, two paragraphs. The two characters meet up with someone else, they get dressed up, they get real pretty, um, and they go out on a walk. <laughs> Not so long ago, there were boys playing baseball in the street, raging against some inner beast, or not resisting at all, taken over by its might. The wrath of boyhood, a scream, a belch, unabashed laughter. The soles of their naked feet slapping the concrete, a bloody knuckle crushed against another's cheekbone, a bruised lip, a cutting joke, a chorus of argument, and when alone or coupled, a sudden gentleness, protection when needed, like showing up to a friend's fight just in case, the ever-present shyness in front of girls, in front of teachers, in front of the mirror, facing their naked bodies. Skinny or fat or too small or too big or smooth or growing hair, each day something new. The fear of jumping, but jumping anyway, even if only to impress. They were everything, everything, boys. Now look at them, girls, or adjacent to them, girly boys, maybe, gliding through the streets of Santo Domingo, protected by the night, soft as feathers, quick as shadows, hiding, but filled with a gust of pride for everything they've made of themselves, what they've managed to take from the corner of the mind for a dream, a fantasy materialized. I will stop there. Thank you so much. That was amazing, Alejandro. That was that was, that was so good. So many good write, readings today. Fantastic day, y'all. Fantastic day. Our next reader, Danielle Bafunda, is the author of nine books of prose and poetry, including Spite, The Book of Scab, Be Shrew, and The Dead Girls Speak in Unison. Her work has appeared in three editions of Best American Poetry, Bax, Best American Experimental Writing, and the Academy of American Poets, a poem a day, and a number of anthologies and journals. She teaches at uh, Rochester Institution of Technology. Give it up for Danielle. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this is such a thrill and like so totally transporting. I've got to like bring myself back to <laughs> to a place where I can read. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share share the text, which is in pretty big font. Um, this is from the Book of Scab. It's um, an auto fictional book or a speculative memoir that came out from Ricochet in 2018. Um, I can't think thank anyone at ricochet past or present enough they've been so amazing um it's such a such um wonderful work you've done with this reading too so it's just a total delight to be here um the book is uh more or less tangling with um the dual object objectification of being a girl and being disabled in youth. Um, and it could say a lot of like post-Freudian and theoretical things about that. Um, but I think kind of what's important for this reading is that it's also just about how um, pain and sex can kind of um, paradoxically uh, contradict that feeling of not being human or not being received as human and um, how they can sort of uh, keep one going in until um, you figure out what love actually is and how and where to participate in it. So I'm just um, gonna read, um, they're all letters, all introduced um, to dear mom and dad. They all close out your ugly little scab. And so I'm just gonna read a couple of those. Dear mom and dad, I'm joining the order, the holy order of cleanest dead. I'm giving away every slutty stack of notebooks, every clump of hair from my brush. I get two bowls of bleach and soak my fingertips. It's time to clean you too. 
I fill the microwave with your belongings and set it for forever. I develop a headache that clarifies my purpose in life none. I pay the neighbor boy $20 to tie my hands and feet together and prop me in a lawn chair. I wear a t-shirt that says psychic. I'm drooling a little from the pain, neat as a saint, trim as a martyr, pressed as primly between one page and the next as an accidental maggot. The moon inflates unbearably and I vomit, an empty hostage, a lidless tin the kittens lick until it rusts through to the sticky basement floor. A wash in caffeine and narcotics, my veins stinging and dilated. I wait for a car to pull in the drive. I wait for its headlights to wash me cleanest, for one seed to be supplanted by another, which scrubs harder than the first, for my shirt to get unstained, for my feet to touch sterile grass. Outside in the foul noise of small life in the wet suburban smudge, medicine bride of medicine and plastic, scurried froth on my lips, vision fracturing until each streetlight's message settles legibly at my feet. The future comes to me as a series of car crashes and a system of graphs. The future is a dirty thing, breathing with its legs together just as fast as they can your ugly little scab dear mom and dad he won't talk to me on the telephone anymore he won't let me get his voice all chugged up inside my gaping holes like a substitute when people die he hangs up on me when everyone is dying he tells me to call back later he replaces his address with a latex glove he never knows me in the street one time we're sitting at the same table and it's our job to find out how many scientists have been crammed end to end in the seafaring vessel the poet made. It's our job to literally understand the cuddling that takes place between one man of science and another who thinks the mind is the brain and proclaims himself the god of science. I can't take the intimacy. I take off one shirt after another until all I'm wearing is a stained strip of cotton. Lost my pants, I say, and regret it because coming out of my mouth, it sounds like the sort of thing an unshaven man on the edge of the platform says. It sounds like pissing disoriented, like a coin so thickly coated it no longer pings against the concrete. When he won't talk to me any longer, I look for signs from him. He won't appear in my dreams, so I'm left with sudden sharp pains in my gut and anagrams in the obituaries. I'm left with counting the twists it takes to break the stem of an apple or the thigh bone from the carcass or the tooth from the mouth of the heavy bitch baby who keeps telling me how incredibly boring I am like this is news. I desperately want to tell him how much I will never talk to him again, how none of his business it is who I've been fucking, how pathetic his reliance on modernist thinkers, how unseemly his posture, how unimposing his lip curled, how bland his t-shirts, how flat his jeans flapping against his bone crotch, how tender, fuck it, how fucking tender his voice when it splits from his best intentions, when it cracks against his hard, warm, tongue stung with ash and cheap food when he rubs his salty hand against my morally inferior drudge case when we get accidentally high at the same party and can't stop leaning up against each other because our hands are cranked and fused into those most basic haunts because we love each other in a way that love means can't stop trying to clear the mud out of your airways in the future when he comes to me full on corpse to register his disappointment in the wah wah I've become, I won't hop the hegemonic vomit comet. I will tell him ex-boyfriend you never would have said this to me without binding my wrists. I'll call him zombie and box his ears up. We didn't want to leave each other for dead, did we? We didn't want to use each other as the ladder out of town, but there wasn't anyone else whose bones stacked so well, whose tendons stretched so long, whose wicked face would dare you to. Are he the horsey I took to the border? Are he a whinny and I squirm in the saddle? But all these pronouns are disagreeable. I only wanted to tell him that we're never doing this again. We're never again getting to the final scene and scrubbing me off. I walk out.
I walk out on the wet grass at night and get my chest heaving like a scud. I go roaring forth into the beetle back night with no friends and no fear. Every pitiful huffing breath cranking out of me like a hand job. Oh, whatever I loved you, I spent the whole cask. I spent every dime that would have been me, and I'd do it again to save us all from having to be ourselves in the future when we're way out of here and gagging quietly all night long, our only punishment for ever having been us, this ugly, ugly, your ugly little scab. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. All these readings, all of them. Good God, it was a good day. You're welcome for this day, everybody. Um, we got two more readers for this afternoon. Uh, first up, Matt Delmonico Connolly is a graduate student in English at the University of Buffalo, working on his dissertation on journalism, pop culture, and the Black Liberation Movement. He is also an editorial associate at the Albright Knox Gallery Museum and writes usually about music comics and race in places like Full Stop, the Comics Journal, and Soul Ride. Everybody, Matt. Hi everyone, thanks so much. Um, I just want to thank everybody at Goldline and all the organizers who made this event possible, who made the book possible, um, and all my fellow readers here today. It is um, just a pleasure to listen um, as well as, as read. Um, the chat book that I wrote is about Ronnie Spector, trying to sing and emerge as an artist out from under several different oppressive institutions, one of which was her marriage to the producer, Phil Spector. Um, and I wanted to read something today that spoke to a moment of victory in the middle of all of that. Ronnie couldn't read music, so she would learn a new song by singing it. When she signed on with Spector's Phyllis Records, she learned the songs with Phil. Ronnie recalls, it would just be me and Phil sitting there and he'd strum the song over and over on his guitar while I read the lyrics from a piece of paper. And there was something very sexy about that. I'd be looking into his eyes while he played guitar and all of a sudden I'd feel like kissing him. I was 20 years old and my boyfriend was telling me how much he loved me by writing hit songs, which I would then sing back to him. He singled her out, made her feel special. After Phil took his recording operation out to LA, the other Ronettes, Estelle, Nedra, and Ronnie's mother made the trip in the car of Bobby Sheen of Bobby Socks and the Blue Jeans fame. Ronnie was flown in by plane. Phil made use of the girl group's form, its uniform, how each singer echoes with variation the appearance of each other singer, the occluding and collective name. He didn't care about the girl group as a band of people. The important thing to him was the sound. As with the rotating cast beneath groups like the Crystals, at times Estelle and Nadra wouldn't even be invited to sing on a Ronette's record. Darlene Love or Cher or anybody or any other body would step in. After the Ronettes went to London to tour with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, Phil's behavior took a dramatic turn. Perhaps it was the simple fact of the physical distance, Ronnie in London out of his control. Perhaps the distance emphasized something else Phil didn't want to face. He could turn a musician into a machine. He could make the studio into an extension of his will. He could pluck a voice from the street and place it at the center of his sound. But in working to make good his claim that ethic and Edisonian genius could transform any song into a hit record, Spectre was losing himself to other elements in music. Phil seemed to back himself up against the hype that was swirling in the industry press. In a strange way, he became the trace of, of a persona that his records were missing the wizard behind the music. He's a replicant of everything he's read about himself, Ronnie tells the music critic Lester Bangs. They say he's a madman, and so he starts acting like a madman. They say he carries guns, so he starts buying more and more guns. The persona was a dangerous one to put on. He had a reputation as a boy genius with the Midas touch, capable of projecting with almost telepathic precision hit after hit into the hearts of the American public. Every subsequent failure would kill this reputation, the reputation's power to fulfill its own prophecies. When the turning point came, he would withdraw songs from the market if he didn't think it fit the mood of the times 
or simply never release material he had spent weeks recording. The Ronettes record recorded a version of Chapel of Love, but Phil pulled it. It went number one for the Dixie Cups a few months later. He had lost confidence in the Ronettes as a vehicle for his image. Though not married until 1968, Ronnie had been more or less living with Phil in his La Colina mansion since 1965. At first, of course, living in such luxury was overwhelming and exciting to Ronnie. But as Phil's ability to work became less certain and he fell ever deeper into his own mythology, life with him became a prison sentence. I wasn't allowed to do anything, Ronnie tells Banks. The day after their marriage, Phil put, built a fence around their mansion, transforming it more and more into a prison. Big guard dogs trained to kill, according to Phil, were set loose around the property. Intercoms were installed in every room so that she would never be unable to answer him. The house itself was like a mausoleum, Ronnie says. Phil kept the lights low at all times. He never played rock and roll anymore and billboard and cash box stopped getting delivered to the house. If Ronnie wanted to drive anywhere, Phil made her take an inflatable dummy in the passenger seat, dressed up in sunglasses with a cigarette so that it would look like there was another man with her at all times. Phil tried to prevent her from performing. And when the Beatles asked the Ronettes to join them on their 1966 US tour, Phil gave Ronnie the ultimatum, them or me. A cousin was sent in Ronnie's place. Maybe the fans didn't know the difference. Ronnie's confinement in the house became so extreme that she would go on benders just to get herself checked into a mental hospital where she could dry out outside of Phil's control. On one such occasion, she crashed a car. She became an alcoholic with intention. The hospitals where she stayed were modern places. They had tennis courts and volleyball. Ronnie could read current magazines, listen to music, and talk to people, nurses, doctors, other patients. She tells Bangs, most of the girls were just like myself, married to very successful men and very bored at home. I had no freedom. I was dying. I was dying within. I was dying for just amusement, for people, to be my own self. Phil pointed guns at her head, threatened her, screamed at her until he turned blue in the face, and still he wanted her to sing him, sing to him every night, born to be with you, by your side, satisfied. When you listen to a Ronette song now, you can hear two worlds. One, the musically totalized world, a reflection of a world of abuse and confinement and sound. The other, Ronnie standing at home in the machinery of production, pushing, reaching, revealing pop music's beauty, singing. Ronnie's favorite song to record was Walking in the Rain. Usually she would come in at the beginning and put down a vocal track. Phil would work on the song until the instrumentals were done, and then he would bring Ronnie back in to finish the vocals. When the instrumentals began playing, there was a low rumble like thunder filling the studio. The thunderstorm in the song's intro garnered an engineer, Larry Levine, a Grammy. When the music faded in, Ronnie started singing, thinking that she would do a rough take on the first pass to get a feel for it. But she closed her eyes and felt the song open up to her and sang it all the way through. When she opened her eyes again, the studio was in complete darkness. Phil's voice came out over the speaker. That's the one he said. We can go home now. She wasn't sure. He played it back for her and there it was, perfect. But what happened to the lights? That was Phil's idea, the engineer, Larry Levine said. He shut them off to help put you in the mood. And it sure worked, didn't it? But it didn't work. Her eyes were closed. She hadn't needed Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful reading, Matt. Um, we are on the last reader of the afternoon. Uh, and I personally had the pleasure of working with this, with this writer with her, for a newer chat book. So Gabrielle Seville is a black feminist performance artist, poet and writer originally from Detroit, Michigan. She has premiered 50 performance artworks. Most recently Jupiter in the 2021 Salt Lake City Performance Art Festival. Her performance memoir, Memoirs include Swallow the Fish and Experiments in Joy. The aim of her work is to open up space. Make sure that um, the spirit of that comes through even in the very tiny little reading I'm gonna do today. So what I wanna invite you, and you know, it's a consent-based practice, so only do what you wanna do, always. Um, but I really want to invite you just to take one moment before we get into my text to capture or identify or locate something in your own body. 
And this is just for yourself, camera on, camera off, identify something in your own body, something that could potentially help you feel good. But you know what? That could be too much pressure too. You don't have to feel good. Just tap in to something. Maybe it's your ankle, maybe it's your wrist, maybe it's your shoulder, maybe it's your neck. But find something in your own body, touch into it and see what happens if you allow it to vibrate at whatever speed or rate feels good to you. It could be so tiny that it's imperceptible to anyone else, but just you can feel it. You know that it's there. And imagine that that vibration is a time machine and that it's taking you to where you want to go. What I'm gonna read actually comes from a certain vibration in my own body that actually connects back to the island that Alejandro also was referencing. This is the island that today is called Haiti, or La Republica Dominicana. And specifically, I am gonna read a little piece from this chat book, Ghost Gestures, from a performance text, a piece of performance writing called Anakaona. Anakaona, who was once an indigenous queen of what is now this island with these places, IET and La Republica Dominicana on it. So that is the vibration. Smear gold. If I tell you I know Anakaona, then you know that I am lying. Russet skin, fleshy eyelids, a recurring dream, the obvious, a white slip, lips like a flattened heart. If I say, I see Anakaona, red bone, almond eyes, lips like a slit, flattened heart, a void, you know that I am a strain, lying men of a certain age, hum, an expected salsa, look at my heels, my diadem, something rending, can't make the journey, something rending, can't make the journey, something rending, can't make the journey, aye bombe, aye bombe, Africa will come soon, the meaning of her name. Anakaona, flower of gold, he cherche de l'or, de l'or, de l'or, or, 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 if I say, Anakaona is, uh, I confess, my own lack named and floating, I smear the standard of history. Still attached to my throne, I start to peel ears of corn. I prepare to address my subjects, my guests. I recite or move with the words of prophecy in my head. Pourquoi? Voulez-vous que nous vous rassemblions? Ne suis pas de votre vie même reine d'un royaume prospère? So says Jean Metellus in his play, Anacona. I say a bow, an entrance fit for a queen, body, memory, anakaona, hauteur and some flesh, smear gold and tender, resignation, peel stock, field prophecies, failing, 
God's market analysis, currency of dreams. We see them skin less, moon faced. They see her, them more dear. She sees herself a monarchy of memory. The queen is hungry, so I peel the corn. And as a kind of aside, begin to speak. Do you all know the Bahamian performance artist, Janine Antoni? She gnawed a giant block of lard and one of chocolate. She cut a backpack out of a cow skin that she hung and stretched. She filmed her boyfriend licking her eye. She displays a monstrous appetite. Anyway, she has one photograph I love, very poised, very West Indian, a parlor with curtains that contain the light, a couch or chair, stiff as if made for this holding, her mother sitting, skin, light, pale, as if she'd walked under a sun umbrella her whole life. Her face is placid and correct, but when you look closer, you see that she has three legs, her daughter, the artist crouches up under her, trying to crawl back in. So many ways to look for Anna Kaona. So many ways to find her devouring and skimming, elaborate and sturdy display. The third leg and the stiff chair and the cow eye and the lard before the burning gnaw. Thank you. That was so incredible. That was so amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're at the very end of this incredible event. This incredible, incredible event. Uh, special thank you to all the readers today. Just once again, just, just give them your love. Uh, Gabrielle, Matt, Danielle, Alejandro. Kaylee, Daniel, Karen, Angie, just all of you. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was wonderful, wonderful hearing all of your work, seeing your performances, hearing you just speak your truths out into the world or into the Zoom room at the very least. Uh, this was wonderful. Uh, so as tradition, we like to take a group photo after our events. Uh, so can we please take a screenshot of everyone for our memories? I forgot who's doing that. Uh, this time around, Thomas. All right. Does everyone, everyone look happy? All right, cool. Awesome. All right, excellent. So uh, we hope you continue su supporting our readers' work beyond this event by purchasing their books and following them on social media to stay up to date on the next events. And very important, please buy their books. They all have books out. They're either out or for pre-order, buy them, buy them twice if you want to, give them to, to people that you love, who you want to experience great writing from, you know, support them, follow them on social media. And uh, please see the links in our chat box for more information about them. So if you wanna stay for a couple seconds, get that information down before you, you leave, uh, that'd be appreciated. Otherwise, thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you to the readers for, people who are struggling with the internet, people who are sitting with us the entire time, people in their cars watching this reading. Uh, it's thank you all for being with us. Um, it was wonderful. It's been a you know, lovely year. 
as editors of Gold Line and, and Ricochet. It's been a strange year else, uh, otherwise, but in terms of this collective, it's been great and beautiful and you know, we'll see you all around.